you know, sometimes with kids, I see that, you know, you have, you have to see the kids that are, that are over there. And then um, maybe when they're finished with their lesson, they can connect them, whatever that they may come here. Or, you know, children may be going over there and we are going to be teaching our young people. <coughs> in prayer, our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the blessing. The blessings of your word that help us within our lives to grow, that we may become like you, become like Christ. Let the Spirit move in us, that we may understand your word. That we may understand your word, that you are the truth in the way and the life of this world. And in our everyday lives, so the title of my message this morning is going to be a question. So I have a uh, ESV Bible translation, and uh, it's going to expand a little bit more than the typical translation, so it's easier to understand for us. I think about back to the 1990s. What friendship was like in school, for example, but today friendships are so based on technology. What's up with that? You know, people have like 500 friends, 1,000 friends on Facebook and Instagram and all these social media sites, you know. And today, with social media, there's like this conversion of connect, connect, connect. And also, there are some apps where, um, they're suggesting things to you, like this, like this, accept this person as a friend, add this person as a friend. So, centering on this idea of friendship, um, and that idea in the modern world, sometimes feel like, oh, accepting friendships with people they don't even know, strangers, and on social media. You know, back in the day when I was growing up, we would have to call people on the phone. And hearing people, you know, they would have a big telephone and they would take like, back in the TTY system, right? That's what we had. We had TTY to communicate back and forth. Um, and you had maybe five or six friends. It was very simple. And it would be very complex to communicate with people. But the internet and social media, Facebook, all these different ways to communicate have made it where our friends expand. And it's a very different experience. You know, constantly accepting quote unquote friendship with all these different people than it was back in my day growing up. You know, is that a good thing? But sometimes it's not always a good thing. Um, they have positives and negatives, right? Social media and the expansion of the quote unquote friends with everyone in the world and the idea of friendship and that concept and trying to understand like what it means in the biblical sense, which we studied God's word this morning. And we're going to take a look at some passages and go delve into this deeper. So, in the scripture, we go ahead and we look at the ideal friendship. And we find this in Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 20. It's the story of David and his best friend Jonathan. David and Jonathan were best friends. Seemed like they were about the same age. Jonathan's father was Saul, king of Israel, and Jonathan was Saul's son. I've seen Jonathan name signs like that. Often you spell it John and then Jonathan, and then David. So David was called to go before King Saul, and King Saul was angry and troubled by an evil spirit. And so David would come and play the harp for King Saul. And the king loved David, and he was the spirit who came fresh to that feet. And the evil spirit would leave him, and he would go to joy. And so Saul said, Oh, David, don't go home anymore. You stay with me. Live with me in my palace. I love you so much. You're such an amazing heart player. 
And God allowed David to be in Paul's kingdom and see what everything was like. And Jonathan and David's best friends, so they also both understood the prophecy about David's future kingship. And what did it look like? I would see in the uh, first hand of the sun. So Saul was trying to kill David. And so David was getting ready to flee, and he met Jonathan. And David and Jonathan met, and, you know, there was a, David had been worried about trying to kill me, and Jonathan said, Really? I'm sure my dad, my dad tells me everything. He doesn't let me know. Great and small, he always tells me everything. I know he's planning, but I don't think he's planning to kill me. Go ahead and go to your father near the feast, near the month of the new moon feast, okay? Um, they'll be, they'll be seated around, and when the king notices that I'm not there, Jonathan, I'm not going to show up to the feast, and um, you know, he's going to ask you, where's your best friend David? And said, oh, he, um, if the king is angry, then you'll know that he beats me. We know that he's planning to kill me. And so Jonathan said, Yep, I will try this. But how can we meet? You know, if my father has to die, you know, what can we do to say goodbye if we have to be separated? And so they came up with a plan to secretly figure out a way. And we were best friends. We trusted each other. And so Jonathan said, So you go hide in this one area. If I find out that my father's trying to kill you, I will let you know. And I have a secret way to let you know. So I will have a servant, and I will shoot a bow and arrow in that area where you are, David. And if my servant runs to get my arrow where it shoots, I'll say, it is beyond you. And that to let you know you need to go into hiding. Jonathan found out, yes, indeed, his father was planning to kill David. It was just as David suspected. David was right. And so Jonathan went early in the morning, took his servant with him, and shot his bow and arrow. He's training and practicing for his bow and arrow. And go to see on you. That was like a signal word to David to let David know that his father was trying to kill him. It's way beyond you. It's way beyond you. My uh, arrow is way beyond you, and so David knew as the servant was running to look to find the the arrow um, that it wasn't in front of you or behind you, it was beyond. And so he knew that was the key word, letting him know that Saul was trying to kill uh, David. So David and Jonathan were best friends, and um, we see that this is an example from the Bible of an ideal friendship. Jonathan bravely followed God's will, so was back to serve as God's side, saying to David, God in peace, we have sworn, sworn friendship to each other in the name of the Lord, saying, The Lord is witness between you and me. And we call it ascending to my descendants forever. First Samuel chapter 20, verse 42. So Jonathan went back to follow Saul. And Jonathan ended up dying in the war with his father. And when David heard about this, his best friend dying, he was so angry. He was so sad about this. And so David promised 
and they promised each other their lineage that they wouldn't wipe out each other's lineage. Because they were best friends. And so David promised to protect Jonathan's father. And Jonathan died, and he had one son who apparently was, was dropped. It became lame. And so years later, after David became king of all Israel, he remembered the covenant that he made with Jonathan, and he brought Meshibbeth, and he had some, he had, even though he didn't serve it, he was Jonathan's heir, and David brought him and had him at the king's table. Even though the grandfather tried to kill David, David was like, no, I was best friends with his father, and his covenant with his father, that if any of his children survived, I would um, bless them. 2 Samuel chapter 9, here's a summary of it. So another example of friendship is Ruth and Naomi. They were daughter and mother-in-law. And Naomi's husband died. And his son died, who was Ruth's husband, and there was no heir. And so Naomi released her daughters in law and said, Go back to your you know, family's household, so you can remarry. But Ruth said, No, I love you. you know, and Ruth said, and, You know, where you go, I will go. Where you die, I will die. Your body will be my body, and your people will be my people. The two of them were good friends, and they became very close to each other. Ruth and her mother-in-law were best friends, and Ruth went and provided for her mother-in-law to care of her, and provided for her physically for her physical needs by harvesting food for her. So Ruth swung, and the word swung in Hebrew means to clean, to get close, to stay close, to see, to take rest, to follow closely, to join, to overtake, to act. But what defines the faithful attribute, what I find this friendship is this, to do it together. Ruth was joined with him, and their friendship illustrates God's faithfulness, those who serve each other, and they are placed together as an extension of the love of God. So if you were to meet the people on Facebook in public, would you even know them? So, but with Ruth and Naomi, they had a true faithful friendship and a true relationship, a very precious relationship, and they obeyed God and God's word. Friendship, the importance of making good choices. Why do we find friends like this in the NFL? Do you know why? It shows the closeness between the two people. Russian sign language, two friends, like, uh, you know, there's different signs.
characteristics of true friends. A really good friendship. What are the characteristics of one? What should be, are the characteristics we should have and that they should have? So a really true friend, a really wonderful friend, is kind. But will offer a kind If you're not doing something that is appropriate for correct behavior, friends will tell you to stop and will tell you this is wrong. You should not be doing this. Not just let them go off on their own way, but in a kind way. Remind them. You want them to be a, a good person. So you want them to stop behaving if it's not mine. Give them a warning as it is. Now that's not mine. That's not secret. You know, what you hear, you can't believe everything that you hear. And that's because you love and you cherish them. You know how you need to go to this building. to love a friend in that same manner, the same way that we would choose gold, that we would cherish them. And then sometimes, as it goes on to say in Proverbs 27, verse 6, that the friend, you know, it says the slap, you know, we think of this as a negative thing. Maybe somebody hit us upside the head or whatever. Somebody that you trust you might say, What happens? What is going on in this? Because if they don't rebuke you, then people who are not your friends and who are your enemies will flatter you to get you to do the thing that they want. So this little cartoon here, so That's your friend. They're with us. Just a, a reminder of, you know, basically to try and help him. You know, say somebody were partying and getting drunk or, or acting in a drunken manner, you would say, quit it. This is not right for you. Or something that they say that is not good for you. And you do that because you cherish your friend because you love your friend. So when you look at these pictures, look at two of the pictures. The back of the picture shows somebody who just got his hand out, then you see his toothpaste in the back of his head. You say, yeah, whatever you do, it's just fine, no, that's right, even though they know it's wrong. So we see that second picture. And we see that it goes with the writing of the proper one. Chapter 6, it says, slap of a friend. Sometimes that's needed for someone. Sometimes you need to be told to stop the behavior. And that means we learn to improve. Because sometimes, yeah, you just take that little back on the back of the head or that rebuke, that reminder. Help us to be wise. And a wise friend will do that. But a foolish friend will. Now we see in a different version, in the New King James Version, it says that faithful are the wounds of a friend because they are done to encourage a person. Good friends, true friends, you know, when they see their friends making mistakes. A true friend will. will feel bad for the thing that you just said. But, it says, 
ketamine? No, when you're doing raw, they're like, oh no, it has to come back okay. It says the chances of an enemy are deceitful because they're not in your best interest. They mock a true friendship. And there are so many verses that apply to this, especially in the King Proverbs. And then too, it says in verse 23, you know, people who correct others will later be like their friends they You know, you just wait until somebody do what it is that they want to do. You, that doesn't mean to their improvement. But those who correct others, but then there are other people too that will give false praise and say, oh gosh, you're doing a great job. Yeah, no, that's wonderful. Keep at it. And that is what the world tends to do. They don't care if you fall into sin, they just encourage you to continue on in your sin and to just keep doing wrong. False friends. Flattery. When people need to be corrected, people need to be told they're doing something wrong. So that applies to the character of the friend. And then it says, through the sweet smell of perfume and oils is pleasant, and so is good advice from the family. How we felt in our lives. Sometimes it's like a sword. You know, people never hold a sword when they go to war. When the time comes, they're in trouble. But when sometimes when you meet a new friend and you're not quite sure how to act with them, you know, instead of starting arguments and getting into all these fights with them, the character of a friend is our lives go to us and we help them and help them to be out. We help them talk to them through. And we help improve their lives. And I'm not to an example of that. You know, somebody is doing something wrong and you just sit by and you just watch them do it. How would they grow from that? How would they develop from that? That's not a true friend. We need somebody. <coughs> Somebody to get in our faces and somebody to help us to, come, to show us where we're at. And to continue on in love. Not to assault them or argue with them or fight with them. But we need good friends who will tell us the truth so that we can develop and just good life. We are all to help one another. and the person that you So it's like if somebody has dirt on their face or something on their face, you let them just go on. There's no dirt on their face. So you go to them and you say, Psst, there's something on your face. And that's what a good friend does. Some people don't want to do that. They, they just leave people in their ignorance and not knowing what it is that Good friend will go to them and say, No, you really, really should change this, and you really should look at this in a different way. You know, when you see people that just fall away from somebody because of something that they're not doing right, if you're a good friend, you don't just sit there and just hand them smile. You go and you help them. 
the post and the And it's like it says, the iron sharpens iron. So we see as iron sharpens iron. When you when you're perhaps sharpening a knife or something. We can sometimes cannot do this by ourselves. We need the assistance of other people to come and help us. We need a fellowship with other people. We need a block of them. So it says that friends practice together and make perfect. And the reason is, as she said, iron sharpens iron. But the pictures that we want to show is that, you know, perhaps you go and you study the Bible with friends. You sit and you discuss questions. Or maybe you go to the gym together. There are many things that you do together. You go in groups. You know, my friends go around and they help each other. They help each other through their lives. Ooh, this is bad. Now, we spoke of good friends, but we are to stay away and put away worldly friends. <coughs> and what we're talking about is people who become involved in bad things. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 33, it says, Do not be deceived. Do not be deceived or misled. For bad friends will destroy good habits, will destroy a good life. You know, the world, they, they let things go, they curse things, they tell them lies, and other people go, oh wow, that's cool. How did you get into that? They become as bad as those other people. They get drinking, not caring about other people, not caring about anything but themselves. And they join these groups and become immersive. And that is the influence of that. And we see that also in, in the deaf world, in the deaf culture. It's very popular. Very popular thing, and a lot of people want, want to join in it and they get in it. They get all on the vent screens and different opinions and all the different things. But the growth of their members is like in the millions. People are always going for that in the thousands. But it's a deceit. It's really deceit. You're becoming like those people. Living their filthy life of sex and all of the different things that they want, more and more and more, bigger house, big this, big looking at them, well, all of these horrible things. And it's shared all over the media, and you see it all the time. And other people say, well, what do you do? People become so fascinated by this. But it ruins our morals. It ruins good habits. It causes destruction within our own lives. So we need to be careful who it is that we choose as friends. And you see, bad friends will call you in to do things that you would not ordinarily do. To follow them. To fall into wrong. Falling to what is bad, they can do so. Things of the world, drunkenness. You can't just sort of willy nilly go into that without thinking. It's a horrible thing. And when Proverbs speaks of wisdom, it says, stay away, put away fools. Because fools cannot teach you anything. They're not wise. They don't know things. 
avoid them at all costs. Beware of them. Because we make things look so easy with bad company. And then sometimes, too, when you're with a friend, see that they're very easily angry, very quick to the people, to fly off the handle. And you really should avoid these people, people who are controlled by their anger. That is bad company. And you need to step away from it. You see them like a group that cannot get along with anybody. They're always starting arguments or fights. You know, it, it soon turns on you. It follows them to that particular situation. Because you can get caught in that same trap. And you can become like them, always argumentative always fighting with people. And there's like a real danger to that. And you see it often. You see the people in the world that even oh. in that community always pointing the fingers at each other and arguing and fighting. They're not supportive of one another. So do you want to join a group like that? Do you want to be with those people that cause the sense that you're going to put this level? The world has no self-control. The world wishes to control you. It's easy to get caught into this. And when you see these things that are happening, you see how people are controlled by media and they get angry by everything that's happening. And you see one and the next thing you got all these people going through the same thing and they're all connected, what? And they're connected in their own anger. And you see that the world, the world amongst them. One person, one person gets it started. And then what happens? Then everybody joins in. <laughs> then you see all of these things. All these people who have joined them. And it just constantly happens. Because this is what is acceptable in the world. And people look at that and they think, oh, it's acceptable to get into fights and to be arguments and, you know, be filled with rage at these people. You see, the friendship of the world is not stop the true friendship. And it's still not. You know, it's, it's such a challenge to children with everything that comes at them, smoking and drinking and, and everything, and it's heartbreaking. You know, you see sometimes that you know, children get really good friends and they fall into the ways of the world, into their adulthood, their 20s, their 30s, their 40s, that stay with them. And these people that draw them into this thing are not good friends. They are not good to cherish them. They will not lead them into the way that we need them to stay. So we need to help our children make good friends. So we see in James in chapter 4, verse 4, it says, So if you are not loyal to God, if you put God away, he calls them adulterers. Those who fall into the ways of the world and have say that they don't cherish God. They look to the things in the world as friends, so to speak. They're called adulterers. You look and you see the things that the world is doing nowadays, and it's just horrible. It says that loving the world is the same. But it's not loving the one. The cheating, cheating on God. The 
the world is the enemy of them. <coughs> it says, do not love the world or any of the things in the world. Being with the world, going with the world, loving all of their things. Do not love them better than the Father. For if you love the world, the Father is not in that. You are not saved. The Father is not in you if you are enamored of the world. All of the things that one can become involved in, the pleasure of oneself, the human thing. You know, not caring about the poor, or caring about your own riches, your own desires, your own wants, the lust of the flesh, sloth and sinful being, doing nothing, always enjoying yourself throughout all of the world. All of the lust that you want, satisfying them all, self promise all of these things. Wanting to please our sinful self, wanting sinful things, and being too proud of the things that we have, finding life possession. Not just having what you need, but all of these other things. Not caring about helping others because you're only so focused on yourself. The Father is not in you. All of these things that come from the world, they don't come from the Father. Falling into the desires of the world, the Father wants no part of that. To focus on the world and one's own pleasures. To be friends with the world, with the bad company of the world, that is to hate the Father. To be always a focus on yourself, you don't focus on God. You don't want God's help. And those friends with you, they help them, challenge you. And you see that the world and their desires, everything that the people lust after, all of these things will come from nothing. You know how they say you're 15 minutes of fame? You know, what's going to happen to people looking at you? I'm going to be famous. I'm going to be the coolest person in the whole world. People will applaud me for what I do and you applaud all the other people in the world. What's going to happen tomorrow? You want somebody new. A new famous person to applaud. A new famous person to go after. You know, a lot of people just want to say that they have friends so they can show how popular they are. But you know, there's always a new person coming along. And then all those people that follow you will follow you as well. You know, when you say, oh, God, it's everything to do with the wonderful educated so great. There's nothing to be gotten from you, then these people move on to somebody new. All of these worlds are dangerous things. There's all the things in the earth that say, but only the Father is forever. He is eternal. And we are to store our treasures away in heaven. We are to honor the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and not the things of the world. For these things are nothing. Friends of the world is with hatred towards God. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life, is not the power, but is of the world. Lost of the eyes. An example of this would be perhaps you see a house made of wood, no cement around it, but it has a block. And you look at that house and you consider where you live. 
and you think, no, I want something better. I want a fancy house. I want a house with a huge garage, a nice driveway, this and that, and this and that. Lots of money out and I want a beautiful, fancy house, right? I want a house. That's an example of lots of the eyes. Another example of lust of the eyes is a man who's heavy, thinking, man, I look at this handsome and have a six pack and a strong wrist and slender. Right? That's another example of lust of the eyes. Or a woman who's heavy and set, being like, man, I look at this super thin and super attractive and beautiful. I want to be better and blessing in their heart and wanting that. And part of life. You know, I want to be better. I want to get better so people will adore me and like me. And I want to retire and have a lot of money. And I want to enjoy my life. Part of life. And this idea of being friends with the world and has a certain thing you should meet God. You should be less humble. You should be less humble. Like people used to be so humble, people thought you couldn't be anyone special. Or this person is super rich and showing off their wealth and getting all this attention and Jesus was just a humble, ordinary person who walked on the face of the earth. Versus the religious people of the day were getting all these accolades and they were so proud and we can turn them in contrast with Christ. So I'm going to go ahead and conclude my message with four main points of this morning. Number one, your friendship with Jesus, John chapter 15, obedience, abide, love, and faith. You obey Jesus? Are you abiding in Christ? Are you loving? And do you have faith? I'm going to bring this down on each one of these. John chapter 15 says, I have obeyed, I have kept my Father's command, and I remain and abide in his love. In the same way, if you obey keep my command, Jesus said, you will remain and abide in my love. Verse 11, I have told you these things so that you may have the same joy, and that my joy may be in you, so that your joy will be the fullest possible, so that your joy may be complete. Jesus said, You are my friends if you do what I command you. Friendship with Jesus. Jesus said to abide in me. John chapter 15, verses 4 to 5. Jesus said, Remain or abide in me, and I will remain or abide in you. A branch cannot produce fruit alone by itself, but must remain or abide in the vine. In the same way, you cannot produce fruit alone, but you must abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Abide in Christ. And then my, my third point on this one is the friendship with Jesus requires love. John chapter 15, verses 12 through 13. This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. The greatest love a person can show is to die for his friends. 
No greater love is there than this to lay down one's life for his friend. Jesus' death is the ultimate expression of this principle. Jonathan and David, right? They loved each other. They protected each other. Friendship with Jesus, faith. Hebrews chapter 11, verses 6 through 8. And without faith, no one can please God. Because anyone that comes to the of God must believe that he is, that he exists, and that he rewards those who truly want to find him, those who earnestly consider to be him. So now we're going to move on to faith. In Hebrews, friendship with Jesus leads to faith in him. In Hebrews chapter 11, verses 6 through 8, it was by faith that no one heard the God's warning about the things he could not yet see. And that is found in Genesis chapter 13, verse 22. He obeyed God, he responded with reverence here and built a large boat and ark to save his family and his household. And by his faith, Noah showed that the world was wrong. They were condemned. They were pronounced judgment against the world. And Noah became one of those who were made right with God, an heir of righteousness that comes through him. Then another verse that connects to faith that talks about Abraham in Hebrews chapter 11 is by faith that Abraham obeyed God's call to go to another place. God promised to give him. He would later receive that place as an inheritance. But this is found in Genesis chapter 12, verses 1, 4, and 7. He left his own country not knowing where he was going. More biblical friendship examples Elijah, Elisha, Paul, Timothy, Mark and Paul, John, Jesus. Moses and Aaron, Abraham and Lot, Jesus and Ruth. There are so many examples of friendships throughout the Bible. But the most important one is your relationship with Christ. How is your friendship with Jesus? I want you to ask yourself that this morning. Is he have a relationship with Christ? How is your friendship with him? Do you know Jesus? Is Jesus your best friend? My husband, my wife, my best friend, my kids. I want you to self the challenge. I want to challenge you this morning. Is Jesus your best friend? Talk is cheap. But do you live your daily life? In friendship with Christ and as a reflection of that friendship, let's go ahead and stand together and close in prayer. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you so much for the blessing of your word and the topic of friendship. This is a difficult topic, God. Please show us how we can help each other. And um, help us to be strengthened and also to just trust in you, God. Help us to go into your ability to ask you for everything we need to do. Thank you.